Okay, you poor, poor ARC 2046, 2020 group. So this is what we have to resort to, uh, but we're gonna make it work. Um, I've already explained how we'll do tutorials in that we won't have them, but I will upload the answers for all of the assignments going forth with fully worked out explanations uh, right there embedded on the page, which is exactly what the TAs are presenting to you in each tutorial. Um, I wish I could have time for every single question, um, but trying to rework the course to do everything online, which takes twice as much work, trying to work remotely from home for all my projects, and also having my kids at home 24 seven, where I have to arrange somebody to look after them even while I do these tutorial or these lectures, is actually just gonna be absolute madness. So think long and hard before you ask a question. Um, make really good use of your TAs, um, and we'll all just work together and hope we can kind of survive this uh, emotionally um, as well as physically, fuck. Um, so today's lecture is all about composite action. And composite action is what happens when we take two pieces and make them work together. So we can have things side by side that share load or on top of each other that share load. But what can we do to force them to work together? Maybe we don't need to do anything at all. Maybe it just inherently does the same thing. Or is there anything we can do to push it further to try to get even more out of that system? So today, before we can even talk about that, we have to understand what load sharing is. So we'll talk about sharing load and how different materials will share the load between them. And then we'll move on to talking about composite action and what that looks like and how that behaves together. And then I'll show you some examples of composite structural construction uh, because we make use of these concepts that I'm gonna talk about today quite heavily in the industry. And some of them inherently we did before we even understood the math behind how it works. Uh, but now we have the means to mathematically reproduce it. Now not only that, we have to be able to prove things mathematically to the building department, other engineers, uh, we need to be able to show how these things work. So it's really important that we have this math at our fingertips. So load sharing is when two elements or materials are arranged so that they mutually support the load they are said to be sharing. The proportion of the load that each resists is proportional to the stiffness of that element or material. Load will follow the path of greatest resistance. So that old adage, the path of least resistance, complete bullshit. For us, load is attracted to stiffness. So the stiffer something is, the more load it's going to see. And if you wanna think of it as um, what happens if you put uh, a piece of steel in bubble gum or rubber, when you stand on it, that steel is going to take all the load. You know that intuitively. Um, but we now we need to understand why that works or how that's happening. So multiple elements supporting the same load share it based on stiffness. So load likes the path of most resistance. So how would a concrete and steel column share the load? To share it at all, they have to move or squash together. If they don't move together, one element is carrying all the load. Remember, our strain equation with delta L divided by L if they're not deltaing the same or not at all, one of them's not deltaing at all, we're gonna see one material take all the load. So what does it take for these things to move together? And that's where this concept of the most resistance taking the most load. But we can start with this assumption to be sharing the load at all in any way, they have to be moving together. If one of them moves more than the other, it's not gonna take any load. So if we remember our old formulas, that stress equals to force divided by area, that strain is delta L divided by L, and uh, modulus of elasticity E is stress divided by strain, we can always rearrange things. There's never a problem in rearranging formulas. So force is equal to stress times area, and stress is equal to modulus of elasticity times strain. So that's just reworking things that we already know. We can substitute things into each other 
giving. So if we take our E strain and plug it into stress in this equation here, we get force equals modulus of elasticity times area times strain. So E and A are obviously dependent on the material and that particular object. Different materials, different modulus of elasticity, different sections, different areas. But we know that E has to be the same for both objects, whatever the stiffness and whatever the area, or else they're not sharing the load at all. So to be sharing the load, E, or sorry, strain, has to be the same for both pieces. So technically what we're saying for each material, the force in steel is going to depend, be dependent on the EA of steel times whatever that same strain is for both things. And the force in the concrete is going to be the EA of the concrete times whatever that strain is. And that strain is the same for both objects. So let's go a little bit further. We want this related to the total load. Well, the total load is some division of the force in steel plus the force in concrete, because those are the two things sharing this load. Well, we know that the force in the steel is EAS times the strain, and the force in the concrete is EA concrete times the total strain. Now, let's kind of pick that strain is the same for both things. Let's just bring it outside of a set of brackets. So we've got EA of the steel, plus the EA of the concrete. Well, that's really saying that's the total EA of everything. We don't know what it is, but we could say it's the sum of all of the EAs for whatever the shape and whatever the material. So the total force is the total strain times whatever sum of EAs we have in this system. The sum of the EAs is the axial stiffness of the combined system. If we wanted to rearrange that equation, we know that the total strain is the total force divided by the sum of all of those EAs. We can plug that back in to our broken up equations where we had Fs equals EAS times the strain and the same for concrete. And if we plug that in to our strain, force in the steel is the total force times the EA of steel divided by the sum of all the EAs. Or essentially, the force times the ratio of EAs for our particular material divided by the total system. So essentially, this is a basic ratio method of relating things, but I've broken it down to give it to you specifically for how we need it for figuring out load sharing. But the concept we're doing here, you see all over all applications. And then the force in the concrete is the total force times some ratio of the concrete EA and the total sum of all the EAs. If we wanna just start writing that a little cleaned up, we can say that plugging that back in again we will get the total force in the steel is the total force times the EA of S divided by the sum of EA. So really, it's just rewriting that same concept I just showed you. So let's just do a thought exercise here for a second. And I kind of touched on this a few minutes ago. Some of the times, it's really obvious where these loads are going to go. But we don't know why. I'm showing you mathematically the intuition you already have. So if we had a steel rod wrapped in Play-Doh, we would intuitively know that the steel rod is going to take the majority of that load. We know that it, even though it has a very tiny area relative to the amount of Play-Doh, it is so much stiffer that it is going to end up taking the majority of that load. If we had a stiffer material wrapped around the steel, it might not be apparent. We know that the steel is stiffer, but maybe not drastically stiffer, not enough to make up for how much smaller the area is. If the steel was 
wrapped in wood, for example, it's not obvious which one is going to take all the load. We know that steel is stiffer than wood, but the wood has so much more area than the steel. The Play-Doh is obvious. We know that it has almost no stiffness, or definitely no stiffness compared to the steel. But wood, we know it's drastically less stiff, but it's about a factor of 10. We saw wood was ranging anywhere from 5,000 MPa to 10 MPa. So I guess it's almost 20 difference because our steel is 200,000 MPa. This could easily be 20 times the area of wood. We could draw it out and figure it out and conceptually do exactly what we're talking about. But I've just broken that down mathematically where we've combined the ratio of stiffness and area to figure out how it's going to share the load. So let's do our first example. If we have a steel HSS column that's been filled with concrete, we want to figure out what percentage of load is going to the steel and what percentage of load is going to the concrete. This is really important because we need to know if the steel works and if the concrete works. So what load in kilonewtons does the steel carry and what load does the concrete carry if we know that the stiffness of concrete is 30,000 MPa. Now, they haven't given us a force, so it looks like we're gonna have to show it as a percentage of a total force, as a placeholder. We'll use placeholder F as whatever that unknown force is. Now let's take a guess, just write somewhere on a piece of paper which one you think is going to take more load. This is normally where I'd say, everybody raise your hand if you think the steel is gonna take more load and raise your hand if you think the concrete is going to take more load. I look at this and my gut would probably say concrete, but I know the steel is so much stiffer. This is one where I think I'd have a hard time making an estimate on which one's going to take more load. So I'm gonna have to kneel down on my kid's cushy pillow here and we'll go through doing these calculations the same way we normally do. So we know that we can look up the exact area of the steel. So area of the steel, we can actually go look that up in our steel tables. We could calculate it 152 by 152 uh, times 9.5 minus 152 minus 9.5 times 2 times 152 minus 9.5 times 2. Uh, but we could just look it up. And we go to the steel booklet and we get 5,210 millimeters squared. Yeah, 5,210 millimeters squared. We can look that up. We know that the E of steel is 200,000 MPa. This is one of those things that I told you you need to know. 200,000 MPa for steel. Just because we can, let's look, let's calculate the EA of steel. So we can calculate that as 5,210 Let me just see here for a second. Yeah, 5,210 times 200,000 MPa, and we calculate this, and we get that the EA of steel is 1.04 times 10 to the 6, 10, sorry, I can see out the window my kids coming back. So I'll have to film this in two parts, but the EA of steel for this system is 1.04 times 10 to the 9 newtons. So MPa is newtons per millimeter squared, and we're multiplying it by millimeters squared, and we're just left with newtons. We can do the EA of concrete now. The area of the concrete is actually going to be this inside
blob right here, which we know would be 152 minus 9.5 times 2 times 152 minus 9.5 times 2. Or what we're saying is that distance times that distance. We can plug that into the calculator and we can get the calculation of 17,689 millimeters squared. The E of the concrete they gave us in the question. The E of concrete is dependent on its strength, which is dependent on how they mix it. So for every single type of concrete, we actually have to calculate what E is. But I've given it to you for this one. We'll talk about that more next week when we talk about concrete as a composite material in and of itself. But for this one, we've been given that it's 30,000 MPA. We can calculate the combined EA of concrete, and it's 17,689 times 30,000 MPA, and we get 0 0.531 times 10 to the 9 newtons. We had 1.04 times 10 to the 9 newtons for the EA of steel. Now some of you can probably start to see where this, was, this is going and start to intuitively figure out which material is actually going to carry more of the load now. We know that it's dependent on that stiffness and area combination. And we can see now that concrete has a lower combined EA than the steel does. So there's a pretty strong intuition here that the concrete's gonna end up taking more of the load, or the steel is gonna end up taking more of the load than the concrete. But we'll go through and we'll complete this calculation. We can look at the sum of EA, which was the EA of steel plus the EA of concrete. And we have the EA of steel as 1.04 times 10 to the 9 newtons, plus the EA of concrete, which was 0 0.531 times 10 to the 9 newtons. We add these up and we get 1.571 times 10 to the 9 newtons. Well, we know that the force in the steel is equal to the total force times the EA of steel divided by the sum of all the EAs. We don't know what the total force is, so we'll leave it as a placeholder F. But we do know what EA of steel is. Okay, hold on, buddy. I'll finish this in round two. Hold on, buddy. Come say hello. Come here, come look at the camera. Come here, don't touch anything. Come here. Come here, boys. Okay. Come over here. You gonna look? No, 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 go over there. Come here, say hi, guys. Say hi, guys. Hi, guys. Duncan, say hi, guys. Hi, guys. Say 